subscribe now and press the bell icon. Never miss an update. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is William Crano, and uh, I, I have the uh, honor of introducing myself as Satvan is having a bit of problems getting connected. Um, I'm very happy to be here uh, and very happy to see some of you. Well, I can't see any of you, but I'm happy that you're here, uh, even though it's fairly early in the morning for you and, and uh, about 9 p.m. here in uh, California, where I'm beaming out to you. Um, today, I want to talk to you um, fairly briefly. I was given the charge of uh, trying to keep my talk to 20 minutes, and uh, that's a hard, uh, hard request, but I'll, I'll do my best for that. And I really want to uh, focus on the idea that almost all, perhaps all persuasion, uh, prevention, I'm sorry, involves persuasion. And that one of our central problems in this uh, field is that many of the, the, the attempts, many of the per, uh, appeals, the prevention appeals that are sent out over the media are not persuasive. And so what you have is a, it, it is a conundrum because there really isn't a reason for people to go along with what you are asking them to do, especially if it's something that they want, don't want to do. There's no reason for me to give something up unless you persuade me that it's bad for me or that I should give it up because it is uh, bad, will play into better health and so forth. So if you don't, if you if you really miss out on the persuasion aspect of prevention you're probably not going to succeed. And we have a long history of that, uh, at least in, in uh, my country, in uh, just presenting work that, that, doesn't seem to, <clears throat> that it doesn't seem to do the trick. So let me start then. I, I'm William Crano. I'm a professor of psychology. I work at Claremont Graduate University in Southern California. Um, I've been here for this university for about 20 years. Uh, apparently, I like it because I haven't left yet, and so uh, let's get started. Uh, we have a wonderful uh, archive of data that has been going on far before the 2000s, uh, where a group of uh, researchers from the University of Michigan have monitored uh, children, well, 12 to 18-year-old children's um, drug use over the course of, uh, of their year. And they monitor many, many different uh, types of substances that people can get into trouble using, uh, illicit substances, illegal substances, uh, and even things that uh, I guess aren't strictly illegal, like cigarettes, but that you probably shouldn't do. And now they, they're also adding uh, uh, e-cigarettes or ends or vaping but i'm not sure how how the wording is is uh, done in in india um and they're they've been doing this for three years and, and have not seen enormous increases in uh use of nicotine through uh vaporizers through uh, ends uh elect electric uh nicotine uh dispersion systems and uh, in fact, that has come on so strongly that um, youth today are probably imbibing uh, more nicotine than when cigarettes, the kind that you and I are most more, more, com more used to, uh, when they were in their heyday. That, that usage of youth uh, among uh, traditional cigarettes has dropped to extremely low levels. But uh, the, the place of that has been taken up by these, uh, by vapes and uh, e-cigarettes, and they've really taken over. I'm going to start using just the word e-cigarettes because it's probably the best well-known. Our uh, federal agencies are using this ENDS, e -N -D -S acronym, but um, most people don't don't use it, and and none of the kids in the field use it. So uh, when you're writing uh, scientific articles, you do, but otherwise. Uh, it isn't done. Well, look what's happening here. This is a, we spend millions and sometimes billions of dollars every year or every three or four years, I should say, in attempting to um, uh, uh, depress uh, both supply and demand. 
over the course of the years from say 2000 to 2020, I, I didn't bring out the, the, the run through all the way to 2020 because I ran out of space in my graph. And also it tells the same story. If you look at what's happening, this is, this is the uh, children's youth's use of, uh, of marijuana over the years. Uh, and those children are, as you see at the bottom, eighth, eighth grade, which means they're about 14 years old, 10th grade, 16, and 12th grade, the final year of high school. Uh, they're 18 years old, after which they go, either go into the workforce or go to, uh, go to college or go into the Army or Navy uh, or something like that. But it's a major shift in their life. And as you might guess, uh, drug use... Uh, it usually gets greater in, in those groups. As you can see, the 12th graders are way up here at the top. This is a, a, a lifetime use of marijuana. Uh, and this is not a longitudinal, not a, a, a panel study. These are, these are different surveys every year that this group takes. They're funded by our National Institute on Drug Abuse. It's a wonderful group, the, uh, the Monitoring the Future People. They do wonderful, wonderful work. <laughs> Their archive is absolutely uh, is, as good as it gets. We've done a number of, uh, of studies on it, and, and it's, a, it's really a rich archive. Well, what you see here, though, are essentially over the years, despite millions of dollars in prevention being spent, you know, what you see is a flat line, at least in terms of one of the, uh, one of the drugs or one of the substances that kids most frequently use in, in my country. And in years too, I would bet. So what's the why why are we doing this? Why are we spending millions of dollars? Why have we been so bad at damping down these curves? They are flat. They're not going down at all. In fact, uh, some of the more recent ones seem to be jumping a little bit. This is depressing. Uh, so here are the issues. Mass media, which is really uh, seems to be uh, the the favorite child these days, even though the uh, uh, the success of mass media prevention campaigns uh, in prevention of psychotropic substances has been irregular at best. The reason why they're still favored is that successful campaigns really are good value. You can reach people even in, in remote places. And if you are, are uh, successful, they are exceptionally cheap on a per person reached uh, uh, calculus. So there's always that golden apple at the end that you're aiming for. However, what you might also think about is that failed campaigns, especially if you're using mass media like television or radio and things like that can be intolerably expensive social media on the other hand are not so not not very expensive uh uh there is a real expense there obviously in terms of creating materials prevention materials and so forth um but they're pretty cheap to mount and you can still reach enormous numbers of people and also do so in such a way that you can really uh, map out their relationships with others in the group that you happen to be dealing with. You can use social media to, to uh, tailor communications to precisely the right persons uh, and take advantage of many of the theories that we've developed over the years in my field, at least social psychology and communication science uh, that really delivers the media, the, the, uh, media to the, precisely the person you want to deliver it to. Why have we failed? Because in my opinion, after reading this literature and being involved in it for uh, 25 years, what it seems to me is going on is that many of the failed campaigns really have ignored evidence on persuasion. And the evidence on persuasion has been building up in psychology and communication science since the 50s. And it is good research, typically, and it is available and you, you, you neglect it at your peril, but a lot of our, even our most expensive campaigns have created ads that when I look at them, I can't imagine 
to what theory they are uh, they are subscribing in putting out what they're putting out. I, I once went to a, a, a fellow who was in charge of a mass media campaign in the United States. It, it, it went to every state in the union. And I was uh, on an evaluation team that looked at what was going on. I was in Washington every six months, which is no fun if you're flying from deep, from, uh, from California. It takes the whole day. And find what I found was, uh, and I told this fellow this, I, I said, look, this, you know, you're paying a lot of money to get these ads on every medium that we can think about, television, radio, magazines, newspapers, buses, you name it. But the ads are not very good. So why do you think a kid, an 18-year-old, ought to look at that ad and say, oh, yes, I'm never going to use that drug again? What, what makes you think they will do that? And the fellow said, well, we're using some of the best uh, uh, marketing uh, groups in the country to do so. I said, well, yeah, but I'm not quite sure that the people in those groups are the best that they have. Uh, since this was all pro bono work. And I'm not sure at all that uh, they know much about persuasion because that's where your ads are falling to pieces. Why would you think that a campaign ad that showed a cartoon dancing bear with a little girl dancing in a circle, the bear was blue, by the way, and every now and then as they crumped around in the circle, they stepped on a, uh, on a, a, a marijuana cigarette on a joint that's on the ground. Why would that persuade a 16-year-old a boy whose girlfriend just offered him a, uh, a, a joint? Why, why would that persuade that boy to re reject the offer? What, 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 what theory is this ad appealing to? He couldn't answer me, so he didn't. Okay, but this is the problem, I think, that many of our uh, failed campaigns have come up with, which is they're not persuasive. And if you're trying to get someone to do something that they, or not to do something that they want to do, you better be pretty good and persuasive or else they're not going to listen to you. In our lab, we have this sign that I have at the bottom of the slide, persuasion, uh, prevention always involves persuasion. That's one of the two or three signs in my laboratory because I want my students to realize that you can't just say something and hope somebody is going to do what you, what they really don't want to do. It, it doesn't work that way. It never has. So let's go to the next slide. We, we are not just losing the battle in my country. And I believe in yours too. If I believe your, if I can believe your, uh, the data that, that come out from your, uh, uh, so your networks of, of data, we're losing the battle for public support, even in adult, even with adults. In in the U.S., 11 states plus the District of Columbia, Washington D.C., have least legalized marijuana use for adult recreation, re recreational purposes. That is the I don't know how it shows up on your screen. But that is these dark green places where it is legal for uh, uh, for uh, recreational purposes. The different states have different requirements, different amounts that you can buy, different amounts that you can transport, different amounts of uh, marijuana plants, different numbers that you can grow yourself. But the but some of the, and some of those uh, limits are are absurd. You can grow enough in, in legally in your own backyard uh, to keep the whole neighborhood high for the whole year. But the, that's another story. In addition to that, 33 of our states plus the District of Columbia, these are the light green ones, uh, have legalized marijuana for medical purposes. A law that basically says, look, if you are suffering from acute, dep ay, 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 from, uh, acute depression or what, what do they do to my, my thing? Just uh, minimize all these. Okay, I'll minimize this. And there it is, click on it. No, that isn't it. Where'd it go? Uh, I don't know, I must have knocked it off. Okay, it this is better. Um, I hope you can still see this. Um, th these, are, these are states that for reasons of, of mercy, basically have said, look, if you're really depressed, deeply depressed, and the and use of marijuana will help you, we'll, we'll prescribe it, that you'll get 
relatively good, reasonable doses of it. Uh, we'll, we'll control the amount of the active ingredients, THC in it. Um, and, it, it, and it's a kind thing to do, you know, if you're suffering from cancer or taking heavy duty uh, 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 medicine or chemotherapy to, to kill the cancer, but it also makes you very sick or feeling awfully awful. It, it's, it's compassionate. It's a nice thing, except for two, re two things. One of them is it doesn't seem to work. And there's no really good. Our National Academies have put out a major uh, uh, book on this, and you can download it for free. Uh, if you go to National Academies Press and, and uh, look at uh, legalized or, or at marijuana use or drug use in the, in the U.S. And what they found was this is some of the best scientists we've got, not just social psychologists, but pharma, psychopharmacologists and so forth. And basically all of the claims that almost all, with very few exceptions, positive claims made for marijuana uh, don't stand up. Uh, to empirical proof. They're not there. But what do stand up is that uh, if, you're a, if you're a young person whose brain hasn't fully developed, by young person I mean you're not yet 25 or 26 years of age, which is when development, brain development more or less has, has done its thing, has gone as far as it'll go. Uh, heavy and frequent use of something as trivial as marijuana can stunt or stop or delay brain development. And it doesn't undelay uh, when you get older. Okay, this is this is not a good finding. I mean, it is a good finding, but it's not a, not a hopeful one if you're using a lot of marijuana and using it frequently. Is there a Another downside, yes, there is. I want you to look at this this other, uh, I've already said this, okay. Oh, this is what I didn't tell you. If you look down here, what you find is that two thirds of Americans today favor legalization, not kids, they're adults. And we have some evidence that suggests that making marijuana, medicalizing marijuana, and by extension making uh, recreational use legal, we have evidence that suggests this may not be a good thing. So why are we doing it? Well, um, here's why we're doing it. This is data from the great state of Illinois. They started in January to use, uh, to uh, sell marijuana for uh, recreational purposes. This is what they found this was the total sales in January of the first year that they that they legalized the drug. They made thirty nine point two million dollars in in sales, and eight million, almost nine of that of those sales were from people out of state. That is, they were living in states where legalized marijuana for recreational purposes did not exist. It wasn't legal. And the numbers uh, after the first month dropped a little bit, but not by much. And as of the one, two, three, four, five, six months, as of June, they sold the, 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 medic, the uh, dispensaries, they wanted dispensaries, sold nearly $50 million worth of this substance. That's interesting. This is the first six months, and it's gotten uh, more, gotten more uh, impressive as time goes by. The state collected $52.5 million in the first five months in taxes on this drug. So one of the reasons why, it seems to me, and I'm a reasonable guy, one of the reasons why this might uh, be very much uh, favored by a lot of our legislators across the country in the different states is because it brings in so much tax revenues. And many of the states are really strapped for funds. They got to do it, or at least they feel like they, they have to. What they haven't counted on is what it's going to cost them 
when you have a whole generation of people who are messed up with this drug, if in fact that happens. I'm not guessing that it will, I'm hoping it doesn't. But there's certainly a possibility. And you know, do you want a whole generation of slackers? I guess that's a, a reasonable question to ask. Obviously money then is one possible explanation as to why we're pushing this stuff into the population um, without worrying too much about what it might do. Now, if in fact this is actually all of this uh, marijuana is used only by adults who have completed brain development and so forth, um, then it's you know, maybe not such a bad thing. I'm not in favor of it, but I, I can't, given that it, we, we can't find much to, to complain too much about, uh, although with, with kids, you, you, you really can. And there's plenty of data out there that shows it is not a good drug for kids. But with adults, okay, fine. You're a grown up. You can do what you want. But there is a downside to this. Let's look at, this is old data, but the, the new stuff is, is just as bad. This is the percent of children aged 12 to 17 in the various states, Colorado, Vermont, Rhode Island, District of Columbia, Oregon, and so forth, in the different states who have legalized marijuana or who haven't. And if you look at this graph, and I hope the colors are coming out well for you, all of the red lines are, you know, obviously the highest numbers are from states that have legalized marijuana by the year 2014. And all of the negative lines, all of the, the, the least lowest use, using states are states that have not legalized, legalized marijuana. I'm sorry, this is medical or, or recreation, okay? So why is that? I mean, this isn't legal for kids, right? If you're 17 years old, you, you can't be buying this stuff. No, but what happens, of course, is that what we found in other research is that it, when you legalize marijuana, either for recreational purposes or medical purposes, it does not necessarily stay in the adult population. It diffuses. And when it's more available, it becomes available to kids who have the money to buy it. And it's not very expensive. And so <laughs> you're lost. You have a big problem and there's not much you can do about it. It's impossible to keep that genie in the jar. Here's another reason why we're losing the battle for public opinion. I'm going to play you a memorable ad from an earlier campaign, media campaign in the United States. This is the campaign. This is the signature view, the signature uh, message of the campaign. You might not have seen it being in India. I don't know if it, if it played in your country, but it played all over the place in, in the United States. And people my age, whenever we see something, whenever we see it, we inv invariably look at it and say, oh yeah, I remember that, that was pretty cool. This is it. Okay, last time, this is drugs. This is your brain on drugs. Any questions? Okay, that was presented to you by the Partnership for a Drug-Free America, a, uh, a group that is uh, that we're doing uh, what they thought was was good good work on prevention. Um, it was a complete disaster, complete failure. It did not work. It did not stop drug use in the least. It didn't even deter it. Why not? Well, here's some responses and questions that the ad evoked on various internet sites. Yeah, can I get a side of bacon with that egg? Uh, could you make that over easy, flipped over easy? Yes, you're gonna eat, are you gonna eat my brain? Because I'm really hungry, mostly from doing drugs. Or no, that's a frying pan and, that, and that's an egg. I think whoever wrote this ad is on drugs. The problem was is that the ad trivialized the problem. It was cute. It was like, oh, look at that, isn't that cool? And, and I agree, I mean, I, I like looking at that ad, but I'm sure that if I were inclined to use any kind of drug that and they, they weren't uh, specific about it, I, I would be uh, not put off by that drug. Uh, oh, I already showed this. Oh, I went backwards, no, I don't wanna do that. Okay, so how about this? This is from the 
South Dakota campaign that really came out this year, uh, it only costs a half a million dollars, unlike the Brain on Drugs ad. And it's uh, 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 an ad that tries to get people to uh, stop using methamphetamines, mostly aimed at kids, but also the general populace. And the tagline of their ad campaign is meth, we're on it. Oh, come on, that's cute. Uh, but you're trivializing a very dangerous drug. Methamphetamines, uh, we, we had a, a period of that, a heavy duty use of that in our country, and it was a mess. It's, it's been damped down, and but it's, I think it unfortunately is coming back. Um, so how should we respond? Here's what we learned over 60 years of work in persuasion, not necessarily on prevention, but persuasion is persuasion and prevention involves it. First of all, don't trivialize the issue. That's the first rule. Don't do it. Don't make it, uh, hi, isn't that cute? Induce the audience to attend to your message from start to finish. Do something now. Make them attend. You can't make them attend, but if, if your message is clear enough and fun enough or interesting enough, people will, will watch what you have to say. And maybe again and again. Require them by force of the message to think about what you're saying. Don't let them get off easily by saying, oh, isn't that cute, a dancing bear with a little girl. Present information in a way that is difficult to argue against. And if you can get buy-in or commitment to act on what you're asking them to do. Remember, a single presentation doesn't do very much. It's a rinse and repeat. So you, 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 know, you, you play your ad to your audience for as often as you can until they get sick of it. Okay. Single presentations are worthless. They don't work. And then if you also can, what you do is booster the initial effect with booster shots. That is, uh, with another, another ad that follows on your original one, maybe a month later, maybe two weeks later. Those are boosters and they keep the pot boiling. If you use, if you brand your ad campaign, that is if you use the same uh, branding uh, uh, symbol, no matter what it is, well, uh, on every ad, that sometimes will play into much better, much more effective later ads because the effect builds on the earlier ones. So try to remember that. This, we call these boosters. Not this. Math, we're on it. This is, this is ridiculous. Don't trivialize the issue, please. Our solution to all of this, and I'm rushing through this because I'm taking more time than I had hoped, but what are you going to do? Not so bad. Is to, is to take what we've learned over the years in prevention and create a model. Many of my presentations, a lot of people used to come up and say, look, I you, you threw a lot of stuff at us, and uh, we, how do you put it all together? I just want to create some ads that work in my school, in my high school. And what 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 can I do? You know, you, you've given me sixty pages of dense prose to read, and so we created in my lab. We created a thing called we called the Equip. It's a model. It's an acronym that highlights the key design features for successful media-based uh, persuasion and prevention based on 60 years of strong evidence and it is uh, clearly presented in some of the manuals that the UPC universal prevention curriculum has has put out one of those manuals involves media-based prevention which I helped to write uh, and and in it we talk seriously about this thing called the equipment what are, what are we talking about these are steps or these are features of your ad usually presented in the order that I'm giving them to you, in fact, almost always, that will help you design messages that persuade people. First of all, you the first part of the equip, the E, is engage. You have to attract and maintain att the attention of your audience. If you don't do that, if people, as soon as your ad comes on, they get up and go into the kitchen and get a, 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 a peach, <laughs> you lost them, right? You can't persuade somebody who isn't there. The second issue, the second step of the engage is exceptionally important and pretty easy. 
it is called question. It is re simply raise a question in the mind of, receiver, of the receiver about, let's say we're dealing with uh, marijuana, about a pro-marijuana attitude that they may hold. Don't persuade at this stage. Don't try to push them around. Merely, at, merely raise a question. Are you sure everyone feels like this? Are you, are you sure that, 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 that your idea is correct? Raise a question. You, you, that's all. And then this third phase is what we call undermined, in which we try to destabilize the attitude. When the person answers, yeah, because of this and this and this, what, you're, what you want to do in the undermined phase is to say, actually, and undermine and inform go hand in hand, actually research from our best medical universities have shown, has shown that using these drugs can be dangerous to you, can make a big difference, and change uh, your future. And then the final part after undermining and performing, informing is what we call persuade, which is I have to show you why it, it would be more profitable for them to listen to you, to take your advice than to stick with their own, uh, own uh, ideas, okay? You can do this. People say, well, how, how long does it take to put that into an ad and, and, and so forth? I mean, we, we only got 30 seconds spot, a TV spot. And the answer is you can do it. Other people have. Why not you? Okay. So this is the equip. Now let's look at the equip in terms of the this is your brain on drugs ad that we just sh that I showed you a few minutes ago. Did it engage you? Did it attract people's attention? Did they stay attracted to it? Yes. Initially, I mean, it got old after a while, but at least for a long period of time, people like the brain on drugs ad. The, the second part, the question, did it raise a question in viewers' minds about whether they should use it or use marijuana or not? No, it didn't. At least not the people that I talked to and, and surveyed. Did it undermine? Did it threaten existing beliefs and provide an alternative? No. This is like the Reagan and Nancy Reagan campaign many years before that, which is, Oh, uh, just say no. Really? How am I going to say no when my best friend says, hey, let's try this? Or my girlfriend or boyfriend. Did it inform? Did it tell you how to avoid frying your brain? No. Did it persuade? Was it persuasive? No. It's telling me to avoid a drug but not how to do it or why I should. And it will fail, and it did fail. But most Americans my age, at least, and even the younger than me, than I, uh, Remember the, this is your brain on drugs, Ed. The, 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 we like to see it. I mean, it's funny, we laugh. But there's a difference between, and this is what the people at the Partnership for a Drug-Free America always came back at me with. Everybody in our whole generation remembers that, Ed. Yeah, right. But here's what you don't realize, is that there's a big difference between mere memorability, how much you can remember an ad, and whether it persuaded you. I can remember a lot of ads that I remember because they're so terrible and work so badly, so poorly. This is one of them. So here's some working assumptions that you need to take uh, seriously when you go into the field. People don't always believe what they're told, especially when they're dealing with psychotropic substances. Uh, most kids think they know more than I do, even though I've been studying this stuff for, 20, for a quarter of a century. And we need to overcome their resistance to attain positive preventive effects. So there's always, always you got to ex expect resistance or what we call counter arguments. That's our first and major ex uh, uh, expectation. In my lab, the other sign that we have writ in big letters is expect resistance because okay? people want to resist you when you tell them to do something they don't want to do. And I think the equip, at least in our research so far, and it's a pretty new model, can help us overcome these defensive reactions. Building on the equip, when we design a persuasive message, we try to make resistance difficult, impossible, or apparently unnecessary. So, for example, if I'm a, if you're a kid and I'm giving an anti-drug or a prevention ad to your parents, you might be listening in, but you're not defending yourself. You're not resisting. Why should you? It's your parents. But by the mere act of exposing yourself to the information. I've made resistance apparently unnecessary for you. And if you process that information, uh, I will uh, have persuaded you. 
or at least move you along the lines to persuasion. Target or tailor the persuasive message to the susceptibilities of your audience. What does that mean? It means talk to them about things they care about. Don't make an ad. To, uh, I mean, let's say you're 50 years old. Don't make an ad that it's going to appeal to 50-year-olds if, in fact, your audience is going to be 16-year-olds. You're going to learn what, what, they, what appeals to them. And one of the ways of doing that is by taking your ads to a smaller group, testing them out and saying, what did this ad tell you? What do you think? Do you think it'll work? Things of that sort. What you'll find will be very enlightening. Okay. Also remember that it's not always a person who has a, a substance use problem that you're trying to persuade. In some cases, the audience may be your legislators or the press or school authorities, okay, who maybe know, don't know quite as much as you know about what's going on. So, for example, if you're using adult, young adult audiences, which really is where I'm, I'm at most of the time, young adults and adolescents, uh, use message sources they respect, they listen to. Don't let them take the easy way out. Oh, he doesn't know what he's talking about. He's 60 years old, something of that sort. Use, uh, use sources of message, message sources that they want to listen to because that will also ma make your uh, engagement job much easier. If I'm a great soccer fan and so forth and, and uh, one of the great players comes on and tells me about something that I don't know much about but I, I've been thinking about using – some substance, and he says, look, uh, you can't be a good player if you use this because it will cut into your your wind and you won't be able to run as fast or as long. Don't do it. It's stupid if you want to be good. If I'm really a fan of that player, I'm going to think very, very seriously about not starting. Okay, so here's some more specific do's and don'ts because we've, we mess this up all the time. First of all, don't overpromise and don't overthreaten. Especially in dealing with youth, they they kind of understand what when when you're full of hot air, and they kind of understand when you're making them promises that they know will not come true. Fear arousing ads. Don't try to scare people. They they usually fail, so avoid them. It'll take it will take. It took me ten years to figure out how to create good fear arousing ads that actually worked. You can't learn it in 10 minutes, okay? And even if you do, I never use them anyway. I don't use them because I don't like them. I don't like scaring people. I think it's silly. Unbelievable ads usually fail. So if I make a promise to you that you know is, wait a minute, this can't be, that will fail. People, people aren't completely gullible. Exaggerated ads usually fail. If I say to you, if you smoke this drug, your ears are gonna fall out. I mean, come on, nobody believes you. Avoid them. Whimsical ads usually fail. No more dancing bears, please. I beg of you, I can't take another one. Disgusting ads usually fail. If there's a disgusting ad on TV and you watch it once, do you really want to see it again? Do you like being disgusted? Most people I know don't. So why would you create ads that you're going to play and play and play when you know you're only going to get one exposure and after that everybody will turn you off? Current feeds, oh, this is this is something that, that is new. It's coming up uh, ever more strongly. If you fail in a persuasion campaign, what happens is, is that reinforces the, the individual's certainty that they're right. And so that what that does is reinforce resistance. So when you get into the field and do a bad ad campaign and it doesn't work, it makes my life, when I come in following you, three times harder than it needed to be, if you had just not done anything. For young adults, use involve opinion leaders as message sources, but choose carefully. You don't wanna build your idol with, with the uh, and try to, in, in youth, try to cre create a norm of abstinence or avoidance. The norm will help guide future group behavior. Okay, so it isn't I'm just trying to affect this one person. I'm attempting to move the entire group into a much more uh, resistant, drug-resistant uh, position. Here are some fear-arousing, exaggerated, unbelievable, and disgusting ads that you might want to look at. This was called the uh, – this came out of a, a campaign to try and stop meth use in, uh, in Montana. 
and, and it morphed into a more general uh, use it everywhere kind of approach. Look at this ad with this, I guess it's a girl, I don't know, or a boy. You'll never worry about lipstick on your teeth again. Well, uh, this is, yeah, right. I mean, all of these things are true, but in the extre in extremists, you it's like that if you use enough meth long enough. But if your friend is doing it on the weekends, the chances are that's he's not he or she's not gonna look like this. Okay. Unless it's a lot of weekends. I'm not saying you should do this stuff, but it the, the, the ad itself is disgusting. I don't like looking at this ad even though I put it up on the screen. I imagine you don't either. So think about your audience. Are they gonna want to re-expose themselves to something that disgusts them? I don't think so. So that's really all I have to say, and I think I've way overshot my time. Oh, Saban, you're here. That's great. Uh, and uh, so I will thank you for your kind attention and then ask you any questions. Uh, and Hello, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, you can. Apologies uh, for everybody in here, and also apologies for I've joined very late. But thank you, Mr. Pino. Your insights were grateful about how American, uh, American, uh, how, how campaigns in America have been working out. And uh, I think a lot more Indian audiences can relate to it about the whole uh, idea about how the, uh, you know, the campaigns were uh, disgusting ads or or fear mongering ads have tried to you know come up on our screens and how we uh, kind of not follow them, of course. You know, uh, it's 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 there, and uh, that's something I think we right now, as somebody who's working and who's seeing this, I can totally relate to how these ads just cannot work for us. Now let's move on to the questions that we have here. Uh, how do you? So, Pastor Sharma is asking, how do we make sure that advertisements have to be age specific? I think I can answer that question. Um, if I may. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, before you get into uh, making an advertisement, there's a lot of studies and research that needs to go on uh, before you do it. So, from that perspective, you look at the kind of audiences you want to target your ad, you want to target your campaign, and then, and, and then once you do the research, you kind of understand what kind of language they prefer, what kind of uh, taste they have, and then you prepare a campaign, of course, with the messaging, and the other work that needs to be uh, done on site. Uh, William, uh, Dr. Trino, would you like to add more to it? Yeah, I mean, the, there's a there's a real temptation in uh, in in advertising, uh, in in prevention advertising, to use um, to use frightening uh, materials, frightening uh, texts and videos and so forth. And in a lot of times, when I'm talking with the person in a ministry who's just been put in charge of the media campaigns. The first thing almost every one of them says to me is, oh, we're gonna scare them to death. And it's like, no, don't do that, it doesn't work. We have a study I know of that fear arousal as a, as a preventive in persuasion was done, I think in 1954. And since then there's been an up and down uh, uh, record of, of accomplishment that basically what we found is that a lot of times when you scare someone about a drug, what they do is focus on, on their fear and not on the thing that's causing the fear. So they try to figure out, well, how, how can I avoid being so scared rather than how can I stop doing this thing that's going to, that's, that's going to give me this big problem that's been promised in the, in the preventive uh, communication. And it, unless you can work with ways of, of pushing the, uh, uh, the, the, the perception or the ideas about here's what you focus on, here's what you need to worry about, uh, which means that in any fear arousing campaign, you have to do a couple of things. I, I'm not, I'm not uh, uh, really uh, trying to push for these because I don't think they usually work. But if you're forced to because you refuse to listen to me, um, one thing that you need to do is really give a solution to the problem. Here's this huge problem. It'll really wreck you to do this. And here's how you can do that. And it isn't just don't use this drug. That's that's silly. 
if people could just stop using them sometimes they would but you it's it's pretty hard to do um but what what also uh you need to do is make sure that the person making that fear arousing promise is very very credible that because it, it, because it's so easy to say oh that person trying to scare me and he doesn't know anything so this is the minor thing that i would add to what what you just said somebody someone's asked uh, someone said very uh, insight interesting insightful presentation dr craner uh in making effective advocacy campaign does the culture of a community make a difference oh yes absolutely um you we uh th this is one of the really interesting parts of the universal prevention curriculum the upc um that was that was funded ultimately by the u.s state department through the colombo plan and one of the things that we did when we were creating those uh relatively thick uh, manuals on persuasion preventive persuasion uh is to realize that we we are really culture bound obviously as, as almost everybody else is in their own cultures we didn't know what the what the what the culture uh was like where our work was going to be attempted to be used so i'm certain that that local norms in india quite di are quite different from those in california for example in in uh uh, in the United States, in many places, and in many places across my country, that vastly different ideas as a, a, about drug use and so forth, as I'm sure there are in India. And so you need to be there. You need to find out. You need to know uh, what's happening in this in this culture. Uh, and and that's the first. That's one of the first things you you do. And then you can apply the science. The science is the science. I mean, it, it, you know, using something to persuade someone, using techniques of persuasion, works no matter what. But it has to be, uh, it, it has to be fit to uh, the, to the context in which they're being applied. So yeah, you, you that is a, it's very important. That's why the UPC is more or less uh, dependent upon you knowing that part and we'll teach you the science part and then you have a nice overall uh, uh, approach to uh, to persuasion and prevention thank you um oh um we have uh, another time for another qu question i think maybe the last one um is it harmful to children if we talk about drugs more often Will it have a spark, or will it be an introduction to children? Yeah, that's a good question, a perennial question that always arises. Uh, should we talk about something? Will it not give kids the the uh, incentive, let's say, to try them themselves? Um, I think if you do it, if, if the conversations are really geared to the appropriate to the are appropriate to the age of the child, then I don't think it's then I don't think it's a bad thing. We we had this big debate in my country about uh, 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 this talking about um, um, I forgot the drug now. Probably cannabis, probably uh, marijuana. And should you do it? Won't you? Won't you encourage your kids to do it, or the people in your classroom to do it, to use it, etc.? It doesn't really work that way. You're not you're not doing it as a as a pitch man, you're not trying to say, hey, you should get some of this stuff. It's really good. Um, and I think the only time that it really hurts you, from what I can tell in the literature, is when you just are inundating with people, with, it, with your kids or uh, adolescents with this, with th this message, this message, this message, this message, about whatever the substance happens to be. And the danger of that is the child gets the impression, gee, if they're putting this much information out there about this stuff. Maybe everybody's using it, and I'd like to be like everybody else because I'm a teenager and I don't want to look strange. And so that's the danger. But in you know, in moderation, those sorts of discussions ought to be done. If parents and kids talk to each other about uh, about these things, what we found, at least, is that you, you can damp down drug usage to next to nothing. If you have a, a warm and and if you monitor your children, not like in a mean way, but in a very warm way, if you monitor your children and know what they're doing because they're self-disclosing it, you have an ideal situation. So it means that if you can uh, develop that kind of a, a 
nice relationship with your child or children. Uh, you, you, you're talking about things that are uh, harmful to them. Is not going to. It probably isn't going to induce them to to want to take a crack at it to try it. So I think that yeah, you could you could. Can you overdo it? Yeah, of course you can. Uh, but again, the emphasis here, at least in terms of parent-child communication, is if your if your child is telling you things that uh, that uh, what what he did when you weren't around uh, in an honest way in an open way, you you're in pretty good. Uh, shape, you, you, it's unlikely that you're going to have too much trouble with the child. Thank you. Um, okay, I think we'll. This really will be the the next one. Will be the last question. Um, okay. The uh, <laughs> is so sorry that he he's unable to connect, but uh, has sent me through this one. Uh, Someone, uh, an attendee, message saying, "I have used actual patient pictures in my Indian Army session. Is that a good idea?" And then you tell them how they could quit. Uh, do you think this is a good strategy? Actual pictures of patients. Yes. Yeah. Uh, here, at least, it would be difficult because of privacy concerns. You'd probably get in trouble for doing that. I I'm not sure. Uh, th th there's, I'm not sure this works uh, very well. We we had a, a, a approach that was popular hmm, a while ago, where where um, you where people were basically uh, being trying to be persuaded by former uh people with substance use disorders okay this is a person who had been maybe let's talk about heroin which also is a problem in my country and in yours too and in uh india as well um so a person who is who had been clean for five years I, I used to use it and so forth it's clean for five years and we would use those people as sources of information as sources for prevention which seemed like a reasonable thing to do except for one problem which is, let's say I'm here and I'm giving a talk. I, I was using this drug for 10 years and I finally uh, was able to break off of it and now my life is so much better, okay? I'm telling this to a group of kids who are thinking about initiating use of this drug. Well, here's a problem with this. A kid is sitting there and they, they, they think maybe differently from you, from adults. They think, wow, that guy looks pretty good. He's in good shape. He's got a good job. He's nice clothes. So evidently, you can do this stuff and then quit, and it's pretty fine. And, and if it was so bad, why did he do it for 10 years? And that is the perception that sometimes is given by, by that. I think that may be what you mean by using pictures of your clients. Um, if they're just scary pictures, if you just have pictures of clients who are really strung out, and in really terrible condition, um, you have you might end up having uh, credibility problems, or it will it could that can never happen to me because because people don't like to think of themselves as being uh, susceptible to horrible things. So it's I don't know uh, I I think it's a, a little bit dangerous to to do that. I'm not contesting whether you, it worked or not for you. It might have, uh, but I think a lot of it might. A lot of what you might have uh, done is, uh, you know, people sort of look at it, watch it, and say, "Okay, fine, that, that was pretty rotten, wasn't it?" Yeah, and then try never to think of it again, which is not what you want. Um, so, I don't know. I, th I I can't really give you a strong answer on it because I haven't seen the pictures themselves or what it is that you're trying to do with them, but. Um, in general, my, my approach is not to do that. My approach is to create the message that I precisely what I want to uh, present to them. Um, and I, I would be, it would be impossible for me to show pictures of, of former clients who are in trouble and so forth. I, you, you, you couldn't do that here. Maybe you can where you are. 
Thank you. Um, well, I think that that uh, is all the questions that we're going to get to. But um, Saban has said that if you have further questions, to email them at communication at spym.org. Uh, you'll see that in the chat box, um, and they would love to answer any queries. Um, I believe that uh, Dr. Craner, you also put your email on your PowerPoint, um, which uh, hopefully we'll be able to share on the ISAP website. Um, so uh people will be able to watch the recording and visit the presentation again uh from today um i think we would just like to uh i know that saban would love to say this uh himself on behalf of uh, isab india but um we'd just like to say thank you so much for your time uh this evening this slash this morning uh dr crono we very much appreciate it and uh, yeah, we are sorry for the, the technical difficulties that have led to uh, more of a one-sided <laughs> uh, webinar uh, I, I, today. If I had to choose which way the technical difficulties went, I'm, I'm glad it was you on you that on me. So <laughs> thank you for coming. And uh, I hope this was a, a, a pleasant and maybe even useful uh, hour for you. I enjoyed it. So very good day. So thanks everyone, and uh, I will answer questions if you you know if you send them to me. They're they're on the slides. And, and, Many uh, thanks. Thank you so much. And uh, just a reminder for uh, individuals, if you are interested in joining ISAP, um, please visit isap.net um, to apply for membership and uh, ISAP India membership in particular. Um, but yes, thank you so much for your time, and we hope to see you back for uh, webinars in the future. <laughs> well, I hope so. That would be great. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Olivia. Bye-bye. Subscribe now and press the bell icon. Never miss an update.